I'm the Director of Strategy at Limestone Analytics and uh, the team lead for this evaluation. And I'm uh, joined by my colleagues at Limestone, Arden, Shannon, and uh, Chris. Um, we're delighted to be here to talk about the evaluation. And as Jose mentioned, this is the end of a uh, long journey where we've been um, the external evaluator for uh, over four years. Um, today's presentation is going to be a team effort. Um, and before we get started, just on behalf of Limestone, I want to give a big thank you to the World Vision team and the entire iGate consortium for being such uh, fantastic partners um, along the journey. I think Jose has already touched on most of the, the housekeeping issues, and I'm just going to touch on a little bit of what we're going to um, discuss over the course of the next um, couple of hours. So today we're going to touch on and give you some of the context related to the um, the project as well as the evaluation design, which uh, we think was quite innovative. Um, we are going to touch on some of the key results. Um, and just to note as well, in addition to the main evaluation, we had two other studies, one related to community-based education, and the other was a, a deep dive on value for money analysis, including a, a cost-benefit analysis study. Um, we're then going to touch on some of the lessons learned, and, and finally, we'll close it with some uh, further questions and a, and a wider discussion of the project. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Janelle. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, please go ahead to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to introduce the project a little further. Um, so, so welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Janelle Zwirmarangedza. I'm the lead for iGate based in Zimbabwe, working with World Vision. And very briefly, the program, I'm sure most of you have, if you're here, you have some contact with it. Um, but essentially, it's been a program in operation since 2017, but it is a second phase of the Girls' Education Challenge. There was a first phase of iGate that focused primarily on access. Now, this second phase, which began in, in late 2017, is more focused on learning and transition. It's led by World Vision, and we have a series of partners, both technical, some um, contributing additional resources, and some extending our operational capacity on the ground. So that comprises World Vision as the lead, CARE and Open University who are with us on this call, um, the SNV, UDA World Bicycle Relief, as well as um, M. Tanjani Women's Foundation, um, Women's Organization was with us uh, in the beginning of the program. So I think we can move to the next slide. Um, and this is just an overview of our operational area. Uh, we've been working with over 300 schools in, in these various uh, districts and provinces across Zimbabwe, uh, reaching over 40,000 children. That is, that is by the point of the end line. As the previous slide indicated, we started, or it's actually here, we started with um, a cohort that began in grade three through form two in 2017 and continued to work with them as they've progressed from grade seven and beyond form four. And that was comprised of both girls and boys, these numbers are for girls, um, in school as well as out of school. So beginning with girls from grade three through form two, progressing as they've continued their education, including, including the, um, those who had dropped out of school previously. Please go to the next slide. And yeah, as, as Zimbabwe um, and the world has been uh, you know, a changing context, this project has experienced a lot of um, different disruptions and also just contextual changes that we've had to adapt throughout. Um, these, these include many different things, uh, both at the beginning, um, there were some changes in the education system, uh, different political and economic uh, environmental events. And you'll note that um, at the, by the time of the midline, we also had to do some rescheduling. And then most recently, as we've all experienced, um, the experience of the pandemic and the effects on schools. So it's been in a, in a very fluid operational context. And a lot of what you'll see is how we've had to um, continue to adapt um, in particular, education has never been completely um, uh, smooth in, in, this, in this school context, but that's where 
you know, our, our flexibility and our partnership with schools and communities have enabled us to continue to um, remain operational and responsive in this context. Um, I think I could move to the next slide. And, and just to point out that, yeah, we've been working in some of the purposefully the most marginalized areas in the country and with some of the most marginalized girls and boys. Um, these statistics kind of give an overview of, of the, the intersectionality of that vulnerability, um, as well as that the fact that it's not a static situation. We've seen changes in, in the marginalization um, categories of different learners. So some of this is change associated with girls as they've aged, as well as the changes in the context that we've shared in the timeline. Um, and I, I think maybe to the next slide, which is just to highlight the different delivery mechanisms that we've had. And we'll get into this um, a little bit more deeply. We've, in the course of the program, there have been four key strategies um, in terms of delivering uh, impact at the community and school level. That included a whole school development program working with primary and secondary schools that was supported by a community learning initiative that has taken many different directions. Uh, underpinned by leadership skills development for girls in particular, and all wrapped up in a, in a network of community champions with, where we've been working to really address some of the social, religious, and other um, norms and attitudes that affect girls' education. So to the next slide, I'd just like to introduce Claire from the OU, who will talk a little bit more deeply on what we've been doing in whole school development. Thank you, Janelle, and uh, good day, everybody. So in whole school development, we've been working with approximately 300 schools. And in the specific classes that the girls were in, we've worked with over 1,700 teachers. If we include everybody who was in the school, because all teachers participated, uh, that rises to 4,187 teachers and school heads. And you'll see from the diagram that actually at the centre of what we've been doing is about new classroom activities for learners and teachers that focus on foundational literacy and numeracy skills. And it is these um, activities have driven what we do and in terms of support, that support is to help teachers try out and do those new classroom activities. And so just looking about what was important components within the whole school development program, there's the school head and their leadership. And that's two forms. There's a commitment that they make to every child learning those essential foundational literacy and numeracy skills in their school to every teacher developing new teaching skills and for everyone in the school and the community to be treated with respect and value. So there's commitment from the school heads and then there is actually making time, space and support. And that's for teacher development in their schools, for teachers to get together and for timetabling literacy and numeracy for the children to do, to create enough space for those children to do the activities that will help them acquire those foundational skills. So school heads critical. And then so we say the classroom activities, and these are in teacher development modules, then what's been critical is that the teachers have been given the tools in their hands, so the modules, diagnostic tools, to support those classroom activities and that those activities are aligned with the curriculum. It's helping the teachers do what they're charged to do. It's not an additional burden, it's a toolkit to help them. And then there's the teacher support in school, the peer support, and that is where the staff development sessions can be used. And again, it's a space to try out those new activities, to talk with colleagues to reflect and to share. And that's very much what drives the model. And then in addition to that, there's out of school support. So that's where school heads, where the literacy and numeracy leads in each school can get together with each other. They can be introduced to new modules so they can help teachers in their school work through them and they can share experiences together. 
And I just want to say that this takes time. It takes time for teachers to work together and to trust each other. It takes time to try out new activities with your learners and courage. And it takes time for teachers not to focus on what they're doing, but to really think and focus on what their learners are doing and what they're learning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Method Ndlaobu and I am the technical manager for out of school children interventions. So in the community-based education, we're focusing here on out of school children. And if you go down there, you realize that in this, area, we're able to reach out to 8,650 out of school children. And so I will talk about how the learning journey of these learners was organized. So you'll find that the learning journey of these uh, learners was organized into four modules, four distinct modules. So in module one, we were focusing on flan skills. Basically, we're trying to give these learners foundational literacy and numeracy skills. And this module was organized into 20 learning sessions. And in each learning session, you will find that there was an anchor activity in which learners were engaging with numeracy and literacy um, activities in order to be able to consolidate their FLAN skills. In module two, we were now focusing on financial literacy and intrapreneurial skills. So we could help these learners to learn some basic business skills. And then in module three, module three was also a very critical module. So here we were allowing each learner to pick a vocational skill of their choice and we would take them to a vocational training center, a government vocational training center for a period of four weeks where they learn a specific vocational skill. And some of the skills that they were able to learn included uh, clothing technology, for instance, um, cosmetology. Cosmetology would include beauty and hairdressing, uh, others would do food preparation and baking, while others would also do building. And because Zimbabwe is an agro-based economy, we also ensured that every child who went through vocational training also did a cross-cutting module in agriculture, so that they, besides their vocational skill, they have something else that they are able to do. In addition to that, every learner also during this uh, four-week residential course was able to do a, a cross-cutting module, what we used to call training for enterprise. So just building those skills, so they relate what they're doing in a vocational skill they also look at it from a business side of view in terms of how they would develop their own business on the day that they left the vocational training center. And so the fourth module was basically a step-by-step -step business modeling. So we gave each learner a module that they were taking home something that would help them to learn step by step 
in terms of how to start their own business. It would have topics like generating a business idea, how to raise money to start your business. I think it just had six key topics and with very practical examples so they could be able to take their next step. So, and in module four again, so we had, we had two of these modules that these learners were taking home. This business module that I've talk, talked about, they were also taking home what we we're calling a transition pathways um, guide, a transition pathways guide. If, if you look at the bottom of that presentation, we are calling it here graduation pathways, but I would better call it transition pathways. So we would, in that module, we are clearly guiding these learners for those that want to go and do an internship or attachment to consolidate their skills. We're telling them how to do it. Self-employment, employment, those want to go and do a, 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 a full course, those that want to re-enroll in school, and those that want to diversify and go elsewhere. In brief, that's how the community-based education learning initiative was organized. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jane McCoy, Technical Lead for Whole School Development. I'm going to talk on a community learning in initiative that uh, we also extended our support to ensure that education did not stop from uh, the original uh, uh, design level where we were working with communities so as to address the barriers to girls' education. So post-COVID outbreak, we established community learning circles across our 380. 318 schools to support learning and ensure that education did not stop. So as you can see, a mosaic of um, learning spaces and opportunities emerged, as you can see from uh, that diagram, where they would learn at homes under, under trees. And uh, then the question arises on how these learners were, were learning. So uh, we provided with uh, printing, printed learning materials to uh, the learners within the community learning circles and uh, also supported the facilitators with uh, WhatsApp daily literacy and um, numeracy activities that they shared to uh, the learners. And in instances where they could not meet physically in groups whilst following the COVID guidelines, uh, they would then share these materials on paper and uh, via WhatsApp to the um, to the caregivers. So uh, they also had learning, sense, learning sessions with uh, the facilitators, with the champions, whilst they are using these uh, daily uh, learning circles. They were also exposed to pre-recorded radio lessons, uh, which uh, helped them, uh, which we also supported with uh, solar powered radios and uh, memory cards that had the, um, the lessons. And we, there was also peer-led study groups where uh, peers would actually help each other within these, uh, within these groups to ensure that learning uh, happened. So learning was happening at home and at the same time at the learning center through these materials and through the uh, WhatsApp daily literacy and numeracy activities. Next slide. So on REACH, uh, in these community learning circles on REACH, we actually reached uh, 15,276 learners in these community learning circles who would meet uh, in uh, two to three groups on these uh, community learning uh, circles. And they would meet uh, for about two hours in the sessions for three to five days per week. And uh, this, uh, as you can see on that picture there, we do have some, some of the uh, numeracy activities that would share the WhatsApp content that would share with our champions to share with um, our learners. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. 
My name is Samson Dawa. I'm the project manager and uh, GSC consortium lead from K International Zimbabwe. And in this education program journey, what we noticed was a significant social injustice reduction and broad based leadership and inclusivity growth in and outside the school environment, primarily for the girls that were at risk of dropping out. And in terms of that, our main focus was to try to address domains that were seen as androcentric in terms of girls not meaningfully participating in and outside the school environment. And in, in terms of addressing that as a program, we're using the leadership skills development where 613 uh, in-school and community leadership clubs for girls and boys were established and supported by 1,118 trained mentors. As we are moving with that journey, the focus was on girl-led platforms so that they'll be able to acquire the key leadership competencies around voice, decision-making, self-confidence, organization, vision, so that once they do that, they'll be then able to employ those um, acquired skills in terms of their participation in classrooms and outside the classrooms. And you'd agree with us that the environment continuously changed so that it was kind of a reflex. And as a program, we also had to adapt to that kind of environment where we then introduced the holiday learning camps, grade seven transient camps, community scorecard, peer leaders. So the holiday camps and grade seven transient camps was mainly meant to build or to prepare the capacities of those girls and boys so that they, 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 they are prepared maybe to transition to secondary school. And then again, as the, the environment continues to be fluid, for example, the, the aspect of COVID-19 and among other safeguarding issues, as a program, we then had to rely on the use of the community scorecard where girls would then come and agree on the issues that were affecting them in terms of accessing education, coming up with learning outcomes. And we also relied on the use of peer leaders. These were very essential in terms of assisting other girls who were at risk of dropping out, reporting abuses cases, especially with regard to, to COVID-19. And um, as a program, again, we had to use the WhatsApp and SS, SMS messages, including reading materials, because from start of this program, the, 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 the thinking was to build these leadership competencies through the school clubs in and outside the, 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 the community. But because of restrictions that were being employed by COVID-19, we had to rely on those uh, strategies. So what you have noticed is that if we are to employ a effective education program, we then need also to use the leadership development so that girls will be able to penetrate into those subjects that were traditionally known or being viewed as boys excelling like mathematics science subjects. But from our experience, we have noticed that kind of uh, social injustice reduction as a result of um, uh, the use of peer leaders and the leadership development in totality. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sam. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. My name is Anna Matsika. I'm the monitoring evaluation and learning advisor for the IGET project. Um, so part of the work that we did uh, under the project was to establish a community champions network. Um, these were volunteers um, who were passionate about um, girls uh, learning at community level, um, these were people that were passionate about um, child protection and safeguarding issues. Um, and also these were people that had influence and power uh, to lead platforms that could change practices and attitudes that were a barrier to girls education. So in terms of um, those that were passionate about children's education, we worked with a network of over 2000 volunteers. Um, who would gift their time um, and expertise uh, if they were retired teachers. Um, to provide learning uh, for both out of school and in school girls, um, both pre COVID and uh, post COVID period. Um, and these uh, volunteers enabled learning um, 
to continue um, as, as highlighted by Jane earlier on. Um, and in terms of the uh, volunteers that were passionate about protection and safeguarding, uh, we worked with a team of um, case care workers who were responsible for raising awareness um, and training communities on reporting and handling uh, child protection issues and also engaging families and communities on how to report uh, child protection issues through the referral pathway and, uh, and, and helping them uh, to access um, support for the, for the survivors. Uh, we also worked with uh, over 1,500 religious and traditional leaders who are custodians of law at, um, at community level. Uh, these provided leadership within their uh, different spaces. For the religious leaders, um, they, we worked with them uh, to influence a mindset shift in terms of the uh, religious practices that affected uh, girls' attendance to school, for instance, or uh, the timing of when the church conferences are held so that they are moved from uh, during the, the, the school term days uh, to during holidays so that the girls would not, miss, um, would not miss school days attending church. And in terms of traditional leaders, it was also to ensure that um, those uh, child protection issues are also reported um, through the referral pathway and that um, the traditional practices also enable girls uh, to continue attending school. So one of the, uh, of the key result areas for, for the Community Champions Network was to ensure uh, that uh, child protection and safeguarding cases are reported uh, as illustrated in that model. Um, so as a project we trained, the, we also strengthened uh, the CCWs uh, to do community engagements, uh, to engage with caregivers and the, and the different uh, power holders within the communities, uh, mainly to strengthen the referral pathway. Um, this emanated in uh, scorecarding sessions that were done at school level involving uh, these other stakeholders. But what was key was the intergenerational engagement between uh, the traditional leadership, the KSK workers and the girls themselves, articulating uh, some of the issues um, especially child protection issues that were affecting them. This then resulted in case conferences, which involved all these stakeholders, the traditional leaders, uh, the case care workers, in terms of discussing and acting upon the reported cases. What we envisioned uh, with this Community Champions Network was to see more support uh, being provided to, to the girls, uh, more support being provided to, to the survivors and them getting uh, adequate um, support uh, throughout uh, the referral pathway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, and uh, to the whole uh, whole team who presented there. And, and as you've heard, it's a very complicated uh, project, lots of different parts, as well as obviously a complicated and changing context in, in Zimbabwe and, and globally. Uh, I'm just going to touch a little bit on the evaluation questions, as well as some of the methodologies that, that we um, use to, to try to address and understand the impact given all this complexity. So in terms of the evaluation questions, we obviously had a, a framework that was much larger than this, but just to summarize the key things that we were uh, trying to understand were first and foremost, what were the learning outcomes for the, the marginalized girls and boys that were participating in the, um, the iGate project. Um, we wanted to understand their experiences of learning, both in the school and in the community, um, whether the attitudes and practices of, of teachers and others in the education sector had changed, and then what impact there might have been in terms of leadership skills uh, for the program participants. The next area of interrogation was really on transition. Um, you know, what were the transition pathways, both for in-school and out-of-school um, girls? as well as, as boys. Um, we wanted to understand uh, shifts in coping abilities and resilience and, and whether they were feeling agency. And then as well, given all the, the other changes, part of what we wanted to understand was whether any other unexpected transition outcomes. And then finally, um, really looking at the sustainability of, of some of the shifts that may have occurred as a result of the project. So whether there was a shift in, um, in norms and practices, particularly amongst community leaders uh, related to girls' education, um, whether there had been shifts in the education priorities and systems, um, and, and looking at that particularly related to the pandemic, 
um, really understanding how the pandemic may have affected uh, both the project and the overall education system, and then just really thinking about whether um, attitudes had changed in terms of gender and social inclusion. In terms of the um, the actual methodologies, this we were we're really excited to leverage a, a combination of of techniques here. Uh, so we used a, a mixed methods analysis, which um, included an impact evaluation as well as um, structured qualitative analysis to really interrogate those parts of the theory of change that were well understood. We also um, used outcome harvesting to really uh, look at those areas where changes may have occurred as a result of the project, but they weren't um, laid out in the theory of change or they were emergent outcomes. And we triangulated these different methods. And so the results that we're sharing with you today are um, in those areas where it comes from all theory approaches uh, where possible, um, but really trying to you know, leverage both the, the granularity that comes from an impact evaluation and the qualitative um, interviews, but then also the outcome harvesting approach that really lets us explore the wider impacts that, um, that we didn't expect. And then as I, I mentioned at the beginning, we had two other additional components to this uh, evaluation that we thought were also quite uh, innovative. First was we did a deep dive on the community-based education and there we really did in-depth qualitative analysis, but also really leveraged text mining to be able to um, really drive the analysis at a, at a much uh, higher level and to be able to um, uh, work our way through a large volume of, of data much more quickly. And then finally, a, a value for money study, um, where we did a, um, because we had the impact evaluation, um, we were able to do a robust cost benefit analysis. And I think we were one of the few uh, GEC projects that, that did so. Um, and the results of, of these two additional studies will be shared with you um, by my colleagues. And with that, I'm going to turn it, um, I think actually what we're going to do is first um, see if there are any questions, and then I'm going to turn it to my colleague Arden, who's going to start Start presenting the results. I know there was one question in chat, um, but I think it's been answered. Um, so if there are any other questions, just please raise your hand. I don't see anything right now, but um, there will be additional time to ask questions uh, throughout. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my, um, my colleague, Arden. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, all right, well, thank you all for being here. I'll, so I'll briefly touch on some of the learning, teaching practices and leadership outcomes that we observed. Um, so at Enline, I think one of the big takeaways is really that students learn more. Um, this is really evident when we consider all of the different kinds of sources of data that we did have in this evaluation. So as Lindsay mentioned, we do have, um, it's not just a mixed methods evaluation, but we also have this outcome harvesting component as well. And across all of the different sources of evidence we have, we do see evidence of uh, certain learners experience significant and positive improvements in both literacy and numeracy. Um, and this is particularly true since midline when um, we know that there had been a lot of adaptations implemented in the project and we saw um, significant gains there. But what, what's really interesting here is when we dig into some of the results, what we also see is that some of the largest gains are really coming from these most foundational skills. And if we think back to the project's theory of change, what we know is that the project really focuses on identifying and, and providing some kind of um, learning strategies for, for these foundational skills. So what we were seeing even at midline is that we were starting to see these, these basic skills really improve significantly within the uh, treatment group compared to the comparison. Um, and what, we're, what we believe we're seeing in Endline is that those kinds of uh, foundational building blocks allowed for greater changes to be taking place between midline and endline. Um, and although, our, so our sample for learning was a little bit smaller at endline, so we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't necessarily have as much power to, to detect changes, but we do still see um, improvements at, in um, learning gains, even between all the way from baseline to endline when we look at um, primary students and, and literacy in particular. But uh, I do wanna just emphasize that we do see these kinds of really big improvements in, in both literacy and numeracy, particularly after midline. 
Um, and what we, we also know is that the learners and communities really widely reported that improvements in these in these areas were a result of eye gate. So there, the people did claim that these were, were uh, related to eye gate, particularly since midline, and that this is likely due to a combination of things. And I'll talk about one of those now, which is a lot of um, participants reported the um, participatory methods as very useful in both classrooms and in the uh, community learning circles. Um, and for so when we look at the actual the, the data, what we see is that about 95% of students in the treatment group are re reporting that their teachers are using participatory teaching methods. So this includes things like encouraging questions, using group work, um, as well as using teaching resources. Um, and this is, I should, I should point out that this is similar to the figures that would be observable within the control group. So we can't exactly point to a causal improvement in some of these teaching practices. But what's interesting is when we look at the head teacher interviews, um, they are much more likely uh, in the treatment group to report that teachers, uh, teacher training has contributed to learning improvements. So um, the head teachers are, are seeing these changes within the classroom activities and, and, and pointing to that as being effective in facilitating learning. Um, and not only that, we did see that learners, and we'll dig into this a little bit more, but we did see that learners saw improved leadership skills. Um, and this is, I, we wanted to include this here in part of the learning experiences within communities and schools, because this was a big part of how the, the program are, uh, the, operated, where we do see peer leaders report um, taking greater roles and responsibilities within their peer group. And this was particularly evident through the CLC program. Um, and when speaking of CLCs, one of the other areas that we do see improvement on is that um, CLC participants were more likely to improve in both literacy and, and numeracy. And, and this is obviously, we can't, um, what, we, what we know is that the CLC participants were, um, these differences were both statistically significant in, in compared to the rest of the control group and the rest of the treatment group. So this kind of marginal effect is what we're looking for, where the added benefit of, of part, being part of the CLCs appears to, it, it led to improvements in, in uh, both literacy and numeracy. We cannot claim that this is necessarily causal because obviously there is a bit of a selection here where not everybody who was part of the treatment group did participate in CLCs. So there's a bit of, um, you choose to participate. Um, but when we consider it alongside the broader qualitative evidence, which we can do because of the evaluation design, we do see that there is a fairly consistent um, or conclusion across the data that these kinds of relationships seem to, to, seem to exist. Um, we don't see any kind of similar differences in learning attributable to some of the other components of the program, like the leadership clubs, though. And so speaking of leadership clubs, so to dig into that a little bit more, um, the CLC and leadership programming really offered girls tangible responsibilities that developed their leadership skills. Um, and so this contributed to what we see at the end line is of a modest, about a two percentage point improvement or a percent improvement, sorry, overall in youth leadership scores since midline. Um, and this is, includes many qualitative examples of increased confidence and leadership among girls. So this was something that really came through in the, in the qualitative data. Um, what we see is that peer leaders in certain communities also actively discuss things like peer pressure, early marriage, assertiveness, and resilience in groups um, within in groups within their communities. And this really enabled girls to develop a, a stronger network of support um, throughout the throughout the program. Um, so I think this is one of the one of the big takeaways of, of in particular after COVID is is that there these networks were much deeper and uh, provided a lot more. Um, a lot more support to these girls throughout the community. So we'll just move us on to transition resilience, but I'll pause there in case there are any questions on the leadership skills so far, or on the teaching and leadership skills so far. Just to highlight, so there's one, there's one question in the chat, um, which is, were the peer leaders and the community champions trained? We got a second coming through, but we'll address that one first. I don't know. For sure. So I believe so. I'll pass this over to the project though, so they can give a little bit more detail. Um, I'm say, like, do you know who would be the best to speak to this? Let me let me jump in. Um, yes, they they were trained. It was it was not a intensive training. It was more of an orientation to the role, and then 
more of the strategy was continuous support. Okay. Thanks, Jenna. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers um, the question. Oh, we've got a second one, sorry, in the chat. Um, how are the leadership skills measured? Um, yeah, this is, yep, that's a great question. Uh, so we use the Youth Leadership Index, which is a, here international has put that together. Um, and this was used across all of the GEC projects and it asked questions about um, girls' leadership skills very directly, but it also asked questions about things like self-esteem um, and, and self-confidence as well. So there are kind of three components to the Youth Leadership Index score, and it's been used fairly widely across um, not only the GEC projects, but other education interventions as well. Thanks, Adam. I think, was there someone that was going to ask a question verbally? If not, we've got so one final question on the chat. So the question is, were leadership skills correlated with learning outcomes or just participation in CLCs correlated with learning outcomes? Yes, um, so that's a great question and it is something we looked into. So we didn't see any systematic relationships between, for example, um, like changes in learning and, and, and leadership skills. Um, students who, I mean, if we're just talking correlation, students who have high leadership scores also tend to be higher performers academically, at least on the learning assessments that we have. Um, but there's no necessarily relationship between like improving leadership and then improving learning scores. We don't see that kind of relationship in the data. Thanks, Gordon. I believe that's all the questions for now, so we can go to the next section. All right. Great. Um, good questions. This is, uh, this is fantastic. So I will move on to the transition and resilience outcomes now. Um, so what we see here is really that we do see that transition rates have fallen. And this is, but this is not specifically true in just the intervention areas. This is true in both the intervention and comparison areas as, and is very expected given the age of the girls within this context. So we know that dropout rates do fall, particularly for girls as they get to the, the uh, upper secondary grades, which is where the sample really was by the end of the project. Um, and so we do see that they, they have fallen to about a little bit below 90%. And this is largely motivated by the decline in secondary school students who now have transition rates of about 85%. Um, and so they have fallen by similar amounts within the treatment and control group. So um, we don't wanna make a lot out of that finding, but I do think it's important to note just within the, within the greater results. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, including pregnancy, school fees, chore burdens, and, and as well as safety traveling to and from school, which are all things that were reported in the data as very common barriers. Um, but we do still see when we look, zoom out from the um, girls education challenge uh, definition of transition, we do still see some, some areas of improvement for positive transition outcomes. Um, the community learning circles are one of those examples. So that's the CLCs. Um, and where we see the, the participants in these circles uh, had better performance and participated more in class when schools reopened. And so this is one, one very um, kind of positive uh, finding within, within some of the data that we have. Um, another um, area where we can see this kind of signal of improved transitions is in the community-based education participants, where um, the graduates from the program did earn more income and had tended to have more community support after participating in the community-based education modules. And so what we, what we find is really that the implementation of vocational training um, really increased the amount of support that was reported by caregivers and community members for uh, community-based education participants. Um, and this was particularly effective for young mothers. So not only were, if, if young mothers were able to um, attend and, and participate in the program, um, what we did see is that they were more likely to develop successful income generating activities and then use this um, for, uh, for, for example, we saw a lot of reporting of using the, the income that they earned from these programs or after their, their programs for the tuition and, and school fees of their families. Um, and this is, I think, kind of touched on in one of the examples here that uh, this is from the outcome harvest. So we just wanted to give a kind of preview of what the outcome harvesting results look like um, or, or how we can 
present them within the, the evidence that we have. And uh, what we find is really that positive, there were positive transition outcomes for girls who remained in the program. And this is specifically about the community-based education program. So, for example, when we when one of the outcomes that we described from the evidence that we had in the outcome harvest is that at least 10 girls and six boys in Mbaolo uh, have started a successful business in the trade that they received through the community-based education program. And so this is a the outcome harvest focuses on very specific kinds of changes that we can observe. And this is one of the, the changes that we did find for the out of school cohort um, was that they did, did start successful businesses. And this was fairly consistent within the community-based education study that we did as well. And uh, Shannon will speak to that later in the presentation. Um, and I believe the last piece that we have on uh, the transition and resilience outcomes is uh, resilience itself. And the results around resilience is, are a little more nuanced. So what we find first and foremost is that CLCs did help to promote resilience and coping mechanisms within the treatment group. Um, we don't really see a lot of evidence that the in-school girls um, demonstrated stronger abilities to make decisions in, the, in terms of their transition pathways. Um, but we do see that at least within the outcome harvest that um, the community learning circle participants really did demonstrate improved resilience and leadership skills. Um, so we don't see, again, we don't really see a difference between the coping mechanisms or stress levels reported by the girls, but we do see that within some subgroups, these coping mechanisms have, um, or students do have more better and stronger coping mechanisms. Um, and this includes things like imp improved resistance to negative peer pressure. Um, and this was, and I mean, these, the, the resilience story is really relevant given all of the significant challenges presented by COVID-19. So this is another area where our kind of inclusion of outcome harvesting allowed us to, to identify the nuance in the story around resilience, where it did promote resilience and coping mechanisms for some students. And this is an area where um, that was particularly relevant given all the contextual changes, but um, we don't necessarily see this translate into overall um, changes in their ability to make decisions about transition and things like that. And with that, uh, we will move on to the sustainability outcomes, but I will pause here in case there are any questions about some of the transition and resilience findings. Yeah, there's one in the chat. Let me just read that out to you. Um, it says, I see the reasons suggested for transition rates dropping, i.e. pregnancy, school fees, chores, et cetera. But broadly, most of these are also a result of the contextual operating environment largely resulting from the COVID-19 limitations. So I wondered how successful COVID-19 pivoting measures could have been in transition. Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think one of the pieces that we find, or, I mean, I think this might actually speak to some of the, when we when we kind of zoom out from just the GEC definition is that, we do see, for example, participants in the community learning circles, which was part of the strategy to respond to uh, COVID-19 and provide students with alternative learning opportunities. The participants in these interventions in particular did have better performance and participated more when schools reopened. So I think um, obviously, yes, there are a lot of changes that would be relevant within the context. Um, and I think that the COVID-19 response to that, uh, I think, worked, we, we are seeing some evidence that the COVID-19 response tried to mitigate some of that. Thanks, Arden. And yeah, no, I hope that, that answers the question. Um, uh, just to mention, obviously keep the questions coming on the chat. If you do want to ask a question verbally, please just raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you when, when it's appropriate. Great, with that, I'll pass it off to Shannon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Arden. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to take us through the last section on the uh, IGAT results around sustainability. And um, sustainability kind of captures a lot of different components of the qualitative data. So um, there's three kind of main levels of results. The first is at an individual level, which Arden's pretty much covered in the previous slides. So I won't go over that too much. And then we also look at sustainability from a community level and a systems level. So we'll start uh, by looking at the community level indicators. 
And one of the kind of key focus of um, community level indicators revolves around safeguarding outcomes. And uh, we see some really positive results coming out of the data here. So um, one of the main findings is that by end line, there's a very large increase in the reporting of abuse cases across many communities. Um, so this is mostly driven by uh, an improved kind of coordination efforts um, by line ministry workers through the support of iGate um, to provide the services to uh, kind of support victims of abuse across their districts. Um, we also see there's uh, an improvement or a continuation of positive attitudes amongst village heads and other religious leaders um, and caregivers to uh, also support the reporting of, of abuse cases within their communities. Um, so I would just add a small caveat here that uh, because of the kind of challenges that came around COVID-19, um, there's simultaneously kind of an increase in abuse cases in general, uh, but we are seeing an increase of reporting as well kind of in response to that. Um, we also see that there's uh, less acceptability around early marriage. So um, caregivers are, are recognizing the kind of negative effects of early marriage and are encouraging um, their children to kind of continue with education or alternative transition outcomes um, rather than, than uh, arranging early marriages for young girls. Um, there's also more support amongst caregivers uh, around pregnancy or girls who become pregnant while they're in school. And uh, this was seen at fairly high levels at midline and has kind of continued to end line. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about this in the next slide, actually. So we'll skip to that one, Arden. So there's kind of two buckets of community attitudes that we look at. Um, one is amongst religious and community leaders and the other is amongst caregivers themselves. Um, so some of the kind of key indicators here amongst um, religious and community leaders looks at general support for girls education. Um, and this was seen at a fairly high level at midline and has continued to end line. So um, the outcome harvest in particular found some really kind of novel results amongst religious leaders who have really championed girls' education um, and taken a lot of quite significant initiatives within their congregations and communities to promote safeguarding as well. So we see kind of continuous strong support at that level. Uh, we also see that the majority of community leaders accept and support girls who fall pregnant. So previously there was a lot of stigma around this and um, girls would frequently kind of drop out of school if uh, pregnancy occurred. So there's definitely more um, community level support for those girls to either continue with school or, um, or engage in other kind of alternative learning channels. And then one area of interest at the kind of religious leader level was amongst apostolic communities. And so there was some concentrated efforts to try to um, improve the practices and norms within those communities around things like early marriage and other safeguarding issues. And what we see at Enline is um, there's not so much uh, significant change within the communities that we can see through the qualitative data, but there is kind of growing accountability around the communities. Um, so members of the kind of surrounding community that has apostolic um, members within it are increasing um, the reporting around abuse cases that come from the apostolic community. So it's not necessarily change within, but it's greater accountability around those communities, which is still, um, which is still positive. And then from the caregiver level, oh, sorry. Um, we look at two main indicators that kind of serve as a, um, an indication for um, support for education in general. One is willingness to pay school fees, and the other one is practices around chores. So uh, for the first, there's kind of a mixed result around willingness to pay school fees. There's a lot of nuance here, especially with, um, with the COVID-19 context and all of the challenges and school closures that happened as a result of that. So unfortunately, learners are still citing um, parents' unwillingness or caregivers' unwillingness to pay school fees as a main barrier to attendance and transition. 
Um, and the outcome harvest in particular found that caregiver education levels are very important in determining whether or not um, school, school fees are paid. So obviously caregivers with higher education levels are more willing and those with lower education levels are less willing to pay. Um, and the head teachers have reported that there's no difference really between treatment and, and control uh, schools in terms of caregivers' willingness to pay school fees. But like I said, this is uh, a very nuanced picture and maybe to be taken with a grain of salt given all of the um, contextual challenges. Um, however, we do see that caregivers are much more willing to reduce chore burdens, especially again within the COVID-19 context so that um, learners have more time to study at home and participate in the community learning circles. Um, and we also saw that caregivers were more willing to contribute kind of time and resources to make sure that schools were able to successfully reopen um, whenever it was safe to do so. So uh, on that side, it was a more positive picture. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and then at a systems level, just kind of very briefly, this mostly focuses on the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education and what we see overall across a number of um, different uh, interviews and stakeholders within the ministry level that there's very strong support for the IGATE-T model in general. Um, so this includes everything from participatory teaching practices, use of diagnostics tools, learning materials and re remediation in schools, as well as some of the other um, kind of components of the IGATE-T model, such as CBE and CLCs as well. Um, and so ministry officials across all the districts uh, were very eager to expand the use of IGA uh, models to other schools in their district and had a lot of reports from those um, other schools that they were eager to have the model uh, delivered to them as well. Um, but from a sustainability perspective, um, at the time of the endline evaluation, there were concerns around the sustainability and scalability of these activities once the program had ended. And this was very consistent, again, from midline, where there's a, kind of an acute lack of resources at the ministry level. Um, and this is across many different faucets of the ministry, including um, the line ministries that supported uh, survivors of abuse. Um, they were very kind of dependent on external resources to roll out um, a lot of the training and outreach that were associated with the IGAT model. And so there were some questions around their ability to continue to do so once the program had ended. Um, since then, uh, there has been notice that they will receive external funding, um, but I would still note that uh, the continuation of these models is very dependent upon external funding. Great, so we'll move to the next one. Um, so overall, we've kind of covered uh, quite a few different results here, so I'll just highlight um, some challenges that arose at a sustainability level, as well as touching on a few of the other um, outcome areas as well. So um, Arden mentioned that uh, students were very commonly reporting um, improved teaching practices within the school. And that was consistent across the qualitative data with the exception of grade seven students. Um, so they report that there were very few changes um, within their learning experience, which included uh, continuous use of physical punishment, um, a lot of teacher absences, and kind of reversion back to that lecture style um, type of classroom teaching rather than the more participatory it was promoting. Um, and so this is kind of understood within the context, again, grade seven is a critical exam year. So we think that there's a lot more pressure on teachers to kind of push for exam results. And as a result, um, they might be more tempted to fall back on kind of what's familiar rather than turning to more innovative methods. So moving forward in further iterations of this type of program, um, there might just need to be more focus on that particular grade or exam grades and the uh, addressing the kind of added pressures that teachers face there. Um, another challenge was uh, teacher absences. So 20% of learners reported frequent teacher absences. This is uh, less than what the control group reported, um, but is still you know, fairly common. 
And then one very important challenge that we saw uh, right from the beginning, so baseline through to end line, um, and was reported through many, many different types of stakeholders that we interviewed was um, infrastructure and resource challenges. So this is just kind of bricks and mortar type issues where um, people really valued the kind of uh, soft skills and the new training methods or teaching methods that were being introduced, but there were still very real limitations in terms of just number of classrooms and physical resources within those classrooms, um, which kind of limit the effect of those other types of improvements. Obviously, as we talked about in the beginning and Janelle went through, uh, there were many different intervention disruptions that um, kind of complicated uh, the rollout, um, but we do recognize that the program was overall quite um, successful at adapting to those challenges. Um, and then one final kind of comment is that um, the ill treatment from peers is still a major barrier. So there's a lot of focus on improving community attitudes and norms amongst caregivers and leaders, which was definitely of critical importance. Um, but one thing that came through strongly at Endline was that uh, many students for example, girls who fall pregnant are still prevented from uh, returning to school and being comfortable returning to school uh, simply because of bullying or ill treatment from peers. Great. So we'll pause there once again if there's any questions. I know a lot of people are kind of at time. We have no questions in the chat, but again, if anyone wants to ask one verbally, uh, please just raise your hand and they'll call on you. But we, we've got one question coming through. Um, let me just read it out to you. Um, so it says, sad about sustainability fears with regard to scalability given lack of resources from the ministry. Uh, any chances of some workable components uh, of the IGA activities could still be merged or embedded in other World Vision international activities or other partners to hone in on resourcing. Can I um, give an initial response to that, Jose? Yes, please, Claire. It's, sorry, it's Claire from the Open University. And just uh, wanted to say about our subsequent work with the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education there. 3rd of April, um, Sorry? Um, and um, to say that we've been working with the ministry on their implementation framework for their education catch-up strategy. And what we have been able to do is to um, incorporate with a short-term strategy whereby um, IGATE developed catch-up material, so a blended approach in school, in community and at home. Those resources have been made available and approved by the ministry and money has been obtained to actually print those out. So that will mean that every school in Zimbabwe will get a pack of learning resources and teachers and community champions will get a guide. And so we feel that's um, a significant um, support for schools going forwards and um, and addresses in part that lack of resources from the ministry because these schools will get these learning resources. And there's also a medium term strategy to um, look at um, empowering learners with strong foundational literacy and numeracy. And that's written into the implementation framework for the government as well. So that short term strategy is funded and the schools will be getting those resources and those guides and also some uh, teacher and champion development. And the medium term strategy is written in. And so um, that could provide a framework for future funding. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, I can also answer or give a perspective for um, well, the, uh, well, from within World Vision International or World Vision. Um, so we, are in the process of actually taking the, the resources, particularly the, the numeracy resources, and then using those to, you know, to, to hone and develop some more uh, project models and project approaches within World Vision that will then be used across, or you know, can be used across all of the, 
the, the national offices across the world. Um, so that's something that we're taking on from IGA as well. Um, and uh, yeah, generally also we've used a lot of the, the teacher professional development materials and kind of the study materials as well um, to feed it into, you know, the current and, and upcoming education projects as well. So that is something that, you know, we've, it has really informed uh, the, the internal approach to, to World Vision. And, you know, we're definitely taking, you know, all the materials and all the learning that we've, we've gathered over this time and then using that for, for further projects. Um, I can also see two hands are raised. I think Natalia, you, you were first. Hi, um, hi, my name is Natalia. Uh, I'm from World Vision UK, uh, Mill Advisor. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's really interesting. So my question, um, I'm not sure if it's relevant for this particular section. It's for, it's more on outcome harvesting methodology. I'm really excited to hear um, uh, about it's being used for this evaluation. And just wanted to ask a little bit more if there is time. Um, if you could, uh, if somebody could uh, talk a little bit more about, in particularly, um, what were the challenges? Uh, how did you find um, specifically, like, ev getting evidence from um, the the kind of changes that were reported through this, that these are attributable to the intervention, um, and how? I don't know. <laughs> I would like to know, you know, everything. How how did it go with using outcome harvesting? Uh, but maybe if you could highlight a particular, I don't know, a challenge or a particular, um, I don't know, learning point that that stuck up, and uh, whether you felt that that this was the best sort of option for um, for the particular outcomes which were not measured at baseline, for example, and. Um, how, how did you find, um, um, yeah, the overall kind of experience of using outcome harvesting? Thank you. Sorry if it's a very broad question. Thanks, Natalia. Um, I, think, I think that's actually a very good question. Oh, sorry, uh, did, was somebody else trying to speak? No, I was going to pass off to you. Uh, okay, um, so I think this is actually a very good question. Um, and I, I think uh, it really gets down to the types of questions you can answer with different types of methodologies. So um, outcome harvesting is really good when you don't have, uh, when there's uncertainty in the theory of change or when the questions are specifically about areas of the theory of change that are uncertain. So this is good for unintended outcomes or unknown outcomes. It's not as it's it, it's not as capable or not as uh, strong when you try to answer very predefined questions. So questions, for example, about um, something like learning outcomes, where you the theory of change around teacher training and, and learning outcomes is fairly well known um, in the literature, and there's a lot of evidence around the mechanisms that affect learning outcomes when it comes to teacher training. Um, it's less well known, for example, what the effect on leadership skills are. There's a lot less, uh, there's a lot more ambiguity in the types of outcomes that would be associated with leadership outcomes or community support. Um, so this would be an area where outcome harvesting is really good at answering those kinds of questions because there is more uncertainty in the theory of change. So I think this gets back to, or so in answer to your question, one of the challenges is, is really understanding where outcome harvesting can be useful within an evaluation. And the nice thing about the approach that I think we found was that because we had the impact evaluation and the outcome harvest, we were, an, we were able to answer a broader set of evaluation questions. We could answer things about Unknown, uh, about unknown outcomes, especially around COVID-19, which allowed, added a lot of uncertainty to the theory of change and to, to the context that the project was operating in. Um, but it also allowed us to speak to um, learning changes or learning improvements, as well as we could, we could measure whether or not there was any uh, detectable change in progression, which we didn't find in this example, but I mean, we do, do find it in particular subgroups. So um, I think that the blend of the two is a really powerful way to answer evaluation questions. And I think you being able to do both of those here has been allowed us to answer a broader set of evaluation questions. But I do think you're, the challenges are that it, it doesn't work for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arden. Um, yeah, I think one, one thing I wanted to mention was, I'm sorry if you, if you touched on it already, but so one, I guess, an, an internal challenge for us going through the process for, as a World Vision for the first time was um, just recognizing that the outcome harvest 
uh, as a methodology is, is not meant to, um, it, it's, it's not like doing a quantitative data analysis where it's not meant to give you um, a representative kind of outcome for, across the whole project. But it's, it's, you know, it's looking more at the kind of the, the depth of the information rather than breadth of the information. And that's something that internally we kept having. So we had quite a few kind of check-in points with the evaluators where, you know, we, we met as, a, as an advisory group to, to, to kind of guide the evaluation as we went on. Um, and we had to, you know, constantly be reminded and remind ourselves that, you know, what we're saying here is not something that that is essentially representative of the whole of the whole project, but it's just, you know, more kind of specific outcomes that we're looking at. So just wanted to touch, touch on that point a bit as well. I, I, this is uh, Chris Cotton, um, one of the evaluators as well. And and I, I want to build on um, Jose's point because I think that's a, a very, very good one. Um, and just highlight that we, in addition to outcome harvesting and in addition to maybe the more quantitative um, impact evaluation that we we did, we also incorporated into the, excuse me, into the analysis, um, more standard um, uh, qualitative um, uh, uh, evaluation techniques as well. So it wasn't just outcome harvesting and quant, it was, it was outcome harvesting quant and, and broader qualitative analysis as, as, as well. So I, I think that, that really that was the strength of a lot of what we did, as Arden was saying, was being able to combine all of these different types of, of um, uh, impact measurement tools and, and exploration tools to, to really understand what was going on. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, I believe, Mvela, you had your hand up as well. Uh, but you put it down so I don't know if, if that was where you added into the chat or if you want to speak to it to what you were going to say yes um good afternoon everybody yes i um i raised my end up to respond to the question or the issue that was raised by isaac in terms of you know the challenge of sustainability seeing the issues of resources within the ministry of um i guess president primary in that education and i was saying there's a teach tpd project funded by fc2 in zimbabwe and one of our aims and initiatives is to really, in the inception phase, to build on what is already there, and then to see, you know, how best can we done that. Um, my knowledge and experience of the ICAT project is much of the way they were. It was ICAT was implementing was such that it's really focused on sustainability. What is it that can be done by the partners outside or by the ministry outside of the external funding of the ICAT project? So that's one way uh, we are responding to to that, um, Isaac. Over. Thank you for that, Bella. Um, we've got another hand up from Teresa. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, just thank you for this really rich, um, fantastic uh, evaluation. And uh, I really value the mixed methods approach. This is just wonderful. My name is Teresa Wallace. I'm from our global World Vision Child Protection and Participation team. I'm the technical director of quality and innovation. And um, I, I have a, a specific question regarding the evaluation, but please feel free to expand. I'm, I'm uh, interested in um, what probably emerged from more the, the um, qualitative looking at barriers to um, education and um, particularly around things like child marriage and how um, engaging with the community actors um, uh, help to change that or the pandemic um, impacted that. Um, but I saw that, uh, I saw a little bit mention of that, but I'm just wondering how strong uh, child marriage may have come out throughout the evaluation. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, Lindsay, I saw you unmuted, but I can take a first stab if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead, Shannon. Great. Um, yeah, so kind of from all the way throughout the baseline, midline, endline evaluation, um, the issue of safeguarding was kind of um, built into 
mostly the sustainability um, section of the evaluation. And so this looked at it kind of from two different faucets. One was, um, as you said, the kind of community norms and attitudes. And so that is really kind of resulting from the area of the program that was trying to build up this broader network of community support for girls. So this is through um, a number of different facets from working with uh, community and religious leaders, with caregivers themselves, with line ministry workers, um, kind of improving uh, through the leadership kind of activities, girls' ability to kind of um, identify and bring up issues that they're facing in terms of access to school and ability to transition to get to school safely, um, as well as from a systems level. So what we saw that was kind of particularly novel at Enline was that a lot of ministry officials were kind of taking on this safeguarding um, issue within their own uh, ministry prerogatives. And so there was a lot more kind of reporting around ministry officials' um, willingness to promote um, like the acceptability of pregnancy and support for girls to transition back to school, um, as well as kind of integrating those uh, reporting mechanisms and line ministry support at a community level. So that uh, there was kind of this virtuous cycle of when a case was reported, there was an immediate follow up and case conferencing mechanism um, so that caregivers could kind of tangibly see um, the results of uh, that reporting mechanism right away. Um, so there was a lot of kind of positive results that were coming through at Enline that kind of was building on those systems throughout the project uh, life cycle. Um, and so, yeah, from an evaluation perspective, it was kind of triangulating that norms and systems level work. Um, and I guess from the project perspective, it was kind of building up those uh, sustainable um, networks of support within communities and ministry um, to kind of take it from many different angles. So hopefully that answers your question, but let me know if I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> I was actually, um, thanks, Janet. I was actually just going to jump in and say um, we do have a couple of recommendations um, in the, the end of the, the presentation. And so maybe if everyone can bear with us, we just have a, a couple slides on the two other additional um, uh, parts of the evaluation, CBE as well as value for money. And then, you know, because I think a lot of the questions that are being raised on, on methods and so on, we can, we can touch on in the, um, in the recommendations. Um, so if that's okay, I might uh, turn it back to Shannon to just speak about the CBE. Sure, thanks, Lindsay. Get us back on track. <laughs> so um, as Lindsay had mentioned earlier, in addition to the actual IGT endline evaluation, we've done two additional smaller studies. And one of them was this community-based education study. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide there, Arden. Um, and the CBE study also took a kind of innovative methodological approach that mixed machine learning and a more traditional kind of qualitative analysis. And so the machine learning was used to kind of take a large amount of qualitative data that was provided to us and kind of um, systematically go through so that we could select a representative sample to do a deeper dive um, through qualitative analysis while kind of maintaining the voice and perspective of all the interviewees and participants in the study. Um, so the indicators for this study were split and um, some of them were looked at through the machine learning kind of more sentiment uh, and text analysis and then the rest were addressed through the qualitative methods. Um, and I'm sure Arden would be happy to speak to some of those uh, methodological details as well. Um, so just a quick overview of the results and um, they might be familiar from what Arden presented earlier. There was a lot of kind of um, additional confirmation of what we found in the endline study more broadly. So first was that 75% uh, of CBE participants experienced a positive transition outcome of some kind. So this includes either re-enrolling back into school, um, finding a formal employment that was you know, safe and decent work, um, or starting their own income generating activity or, or finding self-employment. 
So overall, very um, high success level for participants. Um, there was also very high demand in particular uh, for the vocational skills training. Um, so that was kind of what inspired a lot of out of school youth to uh, enroll in the program. However, once they uh, were enrolled, there was a lot of value also reported for the financial literacy module. So that was the module that kind of helped develop um, budgeting and financial management skills. Uh, the majority of participants earned more income and were better able to manage their finances as a result of the program. So this uh, is really significant in terms of um, providing girls kind of a pathway to more financial independence and kind of sustainability of these activities over time. So girls, uh, or sorry, participants in general, I should say, um, once they started earning income, they were also, um, as I said, able to kind of reinvest that income into their uh, businesses or IGAs um, to make sure that they were sustainable over time. Um, kind of on the more soft skills aspect of CBE, uh, graduates, especially those who started income generating activities, reported that they had much more self-confidence and respect from members of their community. So they were seen as kind of contributing um, valuable skills and resources back into their families and communities. And this is um, very significant in the context of um, the kind of out of school cohort in general, which uh, previously were, um, let's say looked down upon or stigmatized quite a bit within communities. And then Arden mentioned this earlier, but it was reiterated as well in the CBE study that um, the program was particularly effective for older girls and young mothers. So uh, the older girls and young mothers were more likely to finish the program and more likely to um, start income generating activities and then use the profits that they made from those activities uh, to kind of improve the um, quality of their households and reinvest into the school fees for their children, as well as to the businesses that they started as well. Um, so these are just kind of the high level um, snapshot findings of the CBE study. All right, so just to kind of wrap us up with the main findings, I'll just briefly touch on some of the value for money analysis that we did. Um, I will, so the, this was kind of an add-on piece to complement what we had done in the inline report. Um, and we really looked at these four different components of uh, value for money that are often used to analyze projects in the social sector. Um, so these are sometimes recalled, uh, called referred to as the four E's, if you're familiar with that. But I'll go through each of them and how they, they speak to the project as well. And then uh, we'll, we'll cover some of the results from the cost-benefit analysis model we, we built as well. Um, so the first dimension that we always talk about is economy, and this is really thinking about minimizing the cost of the inputs. So just high level uh, piece of knowledge here is that the approximate cost of the program to implement as of March 2021 was approximately 15.4 million uh, British pounds. In terms of efficiency, this amounted to about 376 pounds per beneficiary. Um, this is very much on par or slightly below the um, the figure for other GEC projects as well. So for the projects that had um, some kind of value for money analysis where they did compare the cost per beneficiary, this is uh, either on par or slightly lower than other GEC projects. In terms of effectiveness, what this refers to is really how, uh, whether or not the, the investment is achieving the best possible result given the amount of uh, investment put in. Um, and so with this, when we, when we speak about effectiveness, what we really want to look at is basically everything we've talked about so far. How effective has it been in achieving some kind of outcome? Um, and what we know is that in terms of learning games, there's been about an equivalent of a half a year of additional schooling achieved within the treatment areas. So when we compare the amount of improvement in learning in the treatment group to the amount of improvement in, of learning in the comparison group, this amounts to about what would have uh, occurred in about a half of a year of, uh, of education that is now um, the treatment group has in addition to what they, they um, would have had otherwise. Um, and this is uh, what we what we find is or what we claim is that this is uh, a proof that IGATE has provided an effective uh, way of adapting its intervention to respond to challenges. 
And this, um, I think this is coming through very clearly in a lot of the evidence that we have is that they, there had the adaptation and the fluidity in some of the intervention design has been uh, very effective in responding to the numerous challenges that have um, been relevant in the context. Um, and the last dimension of these kind of four E's or these dimensions of analyzing the value for money is equity. And this underpins kind of all of the, um, the different dimensions of, uh, of this analysis, but really what, what it comes down to is, um, are the services being designed to help the people according to their need or help beneficiaries according to their need? And what we, I mean, I think there's a pretty clear story here that it does, the interventions do address a lot of the needs and barriers of these communities. And, and one of the good examples of this is the focus on foundational skills. This is something the project has emphasized since the very beginning of the program. Um, and this is also one of the things that we're seeing is, has facilitated greater learning overall. Um, and so this is a good example of focusing really on these, these most basic uh, needs within these communities and, and addressing those through the interventions. And the last part of the value for money analysis that was conducted is this um, value, uh, cost benefit analysis model. So we did build um, a full economic model that tries to link the uh, cost of inputs to the actual impacts from the impact evaluation. And because we, we do have the evidence from the, or causal evidence from the impact evaluation design, we are able to do this. Uh, and when we when we built the model, we have um, this, we are able to monetize or put a dollar value on the value of increased lifetime earnings from improvements in in learning. Um, so we did talk about the fact that learning has improved. We can you we can use standard cost benefit analysis methods to put a figure on what that actually amounts to in, in pounds. And when we do this, what we find is that the benefit cost ratio, so the total benefits divided by the total costs, which include implementation costs, opportunity costs of the volunteers' time, as well as the opportunity cost of the evaluation time, um, is still the benefit cost ratio is uh, over one. So this means that the total benefits are greater than the total costs. So for example, if we, if we look at the 0.1 or 1.67 benefit cost ratio, this means that for every dollar that the project spends uh, on implementation, they deliver $1.67 or pounds in, in benefits. So, um, and this is in Great British Pounds. So uh, just to clarify the, the notation there, but um, when we include indirect beneficiaries, which includes obviously a much larger number of uh, beneficiaries than just the direct 40,000 or so, that are included in the direct beneficiary count, the benefit cost ratio increases significantly to about uh, a little over five. So for every pound invested, you get five pounds in return. Um, and so this is a um, this is a fairly high for an education sector. I mean, the distinction between direct and indirect beneficiaries here is important. Obviously, the, diff the results are very different, but the fact that the, there is a, a greater than one benefit cost ratio when we consider this is, is a highly, um, uh, is a very positive result in terms of the project's value for money. So with that, I will pass it back off to Lindsay. I'm sure there are questions about this, but it might be more efficient to, to touch on some of the recommendations and then have a broader discussion about uh, the CBE study and the value for money study and all, as well. Thanks, Arden. Um, yeah, just in, in reflecting on what we found uh, overall in the evaluation, we had, there's a, a few recommendations that we would um, that we, we shared obviously with the, the iGate team, but we think they're also relevant for anyone doing programming um, in this space. If you could just move to the next slide. Um, First is that we, we looked at a number of, of components that, that can and should be scaled up in, in similar programs. Uh, first and foremost, you know, ensuring that there's a flexible and participatory program design that can adapt to the changing circumstances. You know, the, the team did this incredibly well with the shift to the, the learning circles. Um, one thing we did note was that in some of the, and this was touched on before, there were some community expectations related to the CBE program um, that uh, there was a little lack of clarity about what was going to be um, provided. So, you know, just thinking in future programming, making sure that expectations are clear. Um, we'd recommend as well uh, regular refresher teacher training so that those um, new methods continue to be used um, going forward. Um, the importance of foundational skills, um, you know, we agree with the, the approach that was taken by the, the project and this should continue because um, that's really where, where we saw the greatest impact. 
And um, certainly we would recommend that there's a scale up of networks that support the victims of, of gender-based violence and abuse. So those were some of the things that, that we think were, were functioning very well and, and should continue to be scaled up. In terms of future opportunities, and this you know, obviously goes beyond iGate to the, the entire sector, um, it's something that came out quite strongly and it was touched on and, and it was a, a little bit related to uh, Teresa's question. You know, we would recommend a more gen an integrated gender sensitive approach to programming. And so may it be greater engagement in educated men and boys on, on you know, perspectives and attitudes um, because we did find a lot of the discourse related to um, a big focus on girls um, owning their own um, empowerment and agency, but it's important to understand the, uh, the wider context. Um, as was mentioned before, you know, certainly we did see some uh, shifts in terms of support to, to pregnant um, girls and, and young mothers particularly in the education system. But one of the, the big things that came out that, that will need to be addressed in future programming was really the peer stigma. They came out very strongly in the, the qualitative um, uh, inf uh, um, interview, sorry. Um, and so really thinking about interventions to try to address that, that stigma. And then again, some of the sexual and reproductive health campaigns and programming focused um, for young mothers within overall programs. We think that this could um, certainly be um, focused on in, in future opportunities to help drive um, even greater success. And so with that, um, our part of the presentation is done. Um, you know, I think in terms of the the deck, um, the World Vision team, um, you know, I, I assume we'll share with everyone. Um, and there's just to say as well, there's an annex with a lot more information that we're not going to get into here. But but why don't we pause and just see if there are any other um, comments um, on the overall um, evaluation or the different st additional studies or methodology, the program anything. So I'm going to hand it back to uh, Jose at this point to see if there are any uh, additional questions. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, so I'm just going through the chat. So there's a couple of questions. I think they've been answered with the chat, but just to, before everyone else to give them verbally. Um, so one question was, what is the age groups of participants who earned incomes and to start IGAs? Um, and that was answered by Anna, who said so the young mothers and the older girls, which are 16 plus in particular, earned more incomes and had more viable enterprises. Second question is over what period was income uh, increase measured? Um, and the response to that is that, so we had two different cohorts. So one was measured over one year and the other over one and a half years. Um, I think those are the two then. Um, the oh, follow-up question was, what was the proportion of girls and women in CB under 16? And I know we do have that information. I don't know if, I don't have it off the top of my head. I don't know if Anna or anyone from the evaluation team can remember. Hi, Jose. Yes, so for the learners that were um, below 16, they were about 20% of the total uh, number of girls that uh, we supported. Thanks, Anna. Um, next, I think it's comment from Mbello. So on effectiveness, additional half a year of learning came from the CLCs during lockdown levels when schools were closed, with CLCs adapted from community level to household level earning, uh, learning, sorry. Question there. And I think that's all that we have from the chat. So yeah, if anyone has any, any follow-up questions, um, please put them in the chat or raise your hand and I can call on you. Asking questions. Okay, in, yeah, in, yeah, I guess in the meantime, just in case someone's uh, typing or thinking of a question, 
Um, yeah, just to reiterate as well, uh, as I mentioned and, and Lindsay mentioned just now, so the recording will be made available. Um, so for everyone that received a, a calendar invite, I'll send an email with, with a recording link. Um, it's also going to be made available on the, uh, the GEC website or the GEC YouTube, um, who will um, hopefully yeah, be able to, to disseminate a little bit more widely. Um, so either way, uh, you'll be able to, to, to access that there. We can also, also share the, the presentation slides as well as of interest. Um, I'll put my email address at the end of the chat so you can take that down in case you wanted to, if you had any follow-up questions or, or wanted to continue discussion. Um, also to, yeah, to say, so the, the evaluation itself, the evaluation report um, will be available on the World Vision uh, UK website. Um, so I can send that link in uh, to, to all invitees as well. So the evaluation also has an executive summary, um, which I know maybe not everyone has time to, to read a full evaluation. But as Lindsay said, there's also lots of annexes with a lot more in-depth information. Um, so, so please, if you've got the time, I do encourage you to, to put some aside to, to read that. We've also got the, as, as was highlighted throughout the presentation, there's a CB transition study um, and a value for money analysis. So those are both two short reports that um, are available and that can stand alone reports, which are also available. Um, and I can also direct you to if, if of interest. Um, and yeah, so right now we're in the closing phases of, of iGate. Um, and so what that means, you know, we're, we're working really hard right now to just create as many learning products um, to try to, you know, document uh, everything, um, everything that we achieved and everything that we learned and all the project models on iGate. And, and as you can see from the presentation, there, were, there was quite a lot of them. Um, so there's a lot of information there. So just to give you a, a bit of flavor, we've got a couple of uh, foresighters for each of the project components, which were discussed at the beginning. Um, we'll also have uh, a learning report, which is going to come out at the end of the year um, and, and an impact case study report. And uh, also, it, it, you know, something a bit more kind of audiovisual. We've got a documentary series, which is essentially a video of the stories of, uh, of the girls, so the girls telling their own story. So that's going to be um, coming out by the end of the year as well. And we've got a number of different uh, technical briefs and papers on, on safeguarding and on girls, girls' leadership. So so just to yeah, just give you a bit of flavor, there's a, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, a lot of, of evidence that's been documented. There's a lot of products that are uh, either generated now or being generated. Um, so as I said, I'll put my email in the chat. And if you, you are interested, please, please get in touch. And I'm happy to direct you or to continue a conversation if you've, if you've got any more questions. And with that, I don't think anyone's asked any questions. I'll put my email address in the chat. So I guess we can close there a little bit early, um, give people an extra 15 minutes back. Um, so thank you everyone who, who joined in the presentation. I hope you, you did find it uh, informative. Um, as, as I mentioned, you can see this quite, quite a complex project and it, you know, we, we did our best to try to capture everything in, in a short presentation um, to be able to, to talk to you about it. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the, the entire iGate team. Um, so from World Vision Zimbabwe, uh, World Vision UK, CARE and Open University. Um, so it's been, you know, great pleasure working with you and, and you know, thank you so much for contributing to this. And also a special thank you to, to Limestone, uh, our evaluators. Um, you, you know, you guys have been, have been excellent throughout the entire process. Um, you, you know, I, I think we do really have a, a, an excellent report with a lot of, of really, really interesting findings um, and definitely a, a document that, you know, we'll be able to and we we'll certainly will be using for the years to come. Um, and thank you so much also for, for joining us to present this presentation to everyone. And I think that's all for me. Just to add on behalf of the um, Limestone team, big thank you to everyone. It was a, a delight to work with the, the iGate consortium. And if we didn't do any of the questions, particularly about methodologies, uh, enough justice, uh, we please encourage you to, to reach out to us via our, our website, or we will make sure that our um, you can, can uh, reach us via um, Jose. Um, we, we welcome any further discussion and follow up.
I, I'd like to extend that invitation a little bit further, Lindsay, and just say that because this was one of the first, I think, evaluation efforts um, for the GC or for World Vision to try to incorporate such a broad range of, of methodologies in a really serious way, such as outcome harvesting alongside of the, 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 the quantitative analysis and so on. Just if you have any gen general questions about that type of approach, even beyond the iGate pro project, um, please do shoot us an email. We're happy to, to have a conversation with you and, and, and walk you through some more of the details of the experience. Thanks, Chris.